Um, dear God, thank you, for thank, thank you for giving us this day. And uh, today we have a chapel. So please help us focus on this chapel well and learn your words by this precious time. Also, uh, 12 graders will be going to Jeju for their graduation trip next week. So help them be safe and enjoy their trip well. I, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me ask you all a question. Who here knows the Lord's Prayer? Raise your hand if you know the Lord's Prayer. Okay, okay, everybody, all right. I'll, you're dismissed. Just kidding. <laughs> all right, so since we do the Lord's Prayer every week, I thought it would be a valuable exercise to dig into the Lord's Prayer a little bit. So let's start with the verse in the Bible where the Lord's Prayer is included. So that's Matthew 6 verses 1 through 15. So it doesn't start immediately with the Lord's Prayer. Here's Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray... Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And where does he go from there? Actually, surprise, this is where he goes from there. From verse 13, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It doesn't go into, for thine is the kingdom. He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now you might be wondering, what happened to the, for thine is the kingdom and the power? Where'd that come from? Did Jesus just forget? No, of course not. I'll go over that later. Where did, that, where did those words come from? So, Jesus starts off Matthew 6 with what not to do when you're praying and when you're giving. So in verses 1 through 6, he goes over things to avoid. First of all, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. When you give to the needy, Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So the first thing Jesus is warning against is practicing your righteousness in front of other people. In other words, who are you trying to impress? Are you trying to impress God or are you trying to impress other people when you do good things? Jesus says, don't try to impress other people. He also says, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So verses 2 and 3 are about giving, and giving in such a way that pretty much the only person who knows what you're giving is God. So Jesus uses an example. This is probably a bit of a hyperbole, but to say, sound no trumpet 
before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. But can you imagine someone in church having a trumpet player go in front of him? Charlie, you play the trumpet. I'm about to give my offering. Go start playing. Do, do, do. All right, I'm going to put my money in the jar. Of course, it sounds extreme, but that is, pardon me. So, Jesus is saying, when you are doing good deeds, when you are giving, don't do it for the sake of other people. Do it because you love God. So don't do good works to impress people. Do good works because you love God and you love your neighbor. Now, you might be asking, how do I love my neighbor? Well, thanks to Mr. Joseph, we know about the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments can be summed up in two parts. The first four commandments are all about loving your God, and the next six are all about loving your neighbor. So you should do good works because you love your God and because you love your neighbor, not because you're trying to get other people to say, ooh, he's a good person. What else should you avoid doing? Jesus says, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. Now, the word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypokritikos. And hypokritikos were actors, people who wore masks to present themselves as either being very sad or happy. So hypocrite basically means actor or faker. And so when you pray, don't be like the fakers. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Can you imagine someone on a street corner just yelling out to God, Dear God, I pray that you would be with this JCS Semaul building. That's the name of our building, right? Yes. Yeah. I pray that you would be with the students here, that they would do so well on their tests. I don't think that would go over very well with anybody. But Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that. When you pray, you should pray in secret. Now, when you pray, don't pray for the sake of other people's praise. Pray so that you can praise God. So I've got a couple verses here. What both of these verses say is give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. That should be the purpose of your prayer. Not so that other people say, wow, he's a really good prayer. And I know a lot of you guys go to church and you hear a lot of people praying. And sometimes you're thinking, man, I wish I could pray like that. Whew. Now, there is nothing wrong with praying in public. Jesus prayed in public many times, but it's all about the purpose of your prayer. Are you praying because you want to have a closer relationship with God? Or are you praying because you want other people to look at you and think, whoo, he sure is holy. Now, Jesus then says, thankfully, what you should do. So he says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, like I said, there's nothing wrong with praying in public. We do it all the time. I just did it now. But the point of praying in a room on your own, hopefully without your smartphone, without your computer, without any TV or anything, is so that you can focus on God, so that you're not distracted by anything. So the first purpose, the first thing that Jesus recommends when it comes to praying is to focus on God. Find a place where the only thing that you can focus on is God. Not on your phone, not on the TV, not even on the cars outside, if that's something that might distract you. The next thing Jesus recommends is to follow his example. Because he says the Gentiles, when they pray, they heap up empty phrases. And they think that quantity is more important than quality. They heap up many words. Don't be like them. For your father knows what you need before you ask him. You don't need to give a two hour long prayer if you're just saying the same thing over again. God's not going to be impressed. God's got all the time in the world. You don't. So instead of praying like the Gentiles, or instead of even praying, because by the way, we're all Gentiles, in case you didn't know, if you're not Jewish, you're a Gentile. We're all Gentiles. But if you are praying, think about what you're saying. And the irony of this is that the Lord's Prayer is something that we can end up just 
saying without much meaning because we know it so well, and that's part of the reason why I'm giving this talk. So instead of just saying the Lord's Prayer because you know it and saying it over and over and over again, God's not going to be impressed by that. God wants you to be thinking and being intentional about what you say. So the second thing you should do is follow Jesus' example in the form of the Lord's Prayer. So in Jesus' prayer, I want you to notice a few things. First of all, who are you praying to? He doesn't say, my God in heaven. He says, our Father in heaven. There's something very interesting about that. First of all, because we are Gentiles. We are part of God's family now. And that's not the way it always was. We can be part of God's family because of Christ's sacrifice. Also notice that it's our Father in heaven. We are part part of the body and family of Christ. So when you pray, you should be thinking about the fact that you as a Christian are part of this family of Christians, all the Christians who have ever been, who are and will ever be. It's a big family. So the first thing you should be mindful of when you're praying is the fact that you're praying to our Father. Now, Romans 8, 14 to 17 is a really good verse to make you think about the fact that you are a daughter or a son of God. So Romans 8, pardon me, is it, I think it's 8. I think I just wrote 6 in there. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So the first thing you should be mindful of when you pray the Lord's Prayer is the fact that God is your Father. I mean, think about if some famous person, I'm trying to think of, Think about if, let's see, for the boys, you probably all know Kim Ha-sung. You all know Kim Ha-sung? Or, uh, let's see, Son Heung-min. Imagine if Son Heung-min or Kim Ha-sung was your dad. That'd be pretty cool. You get to go to all the Tottenham games, all the Premier League games. If Kim Ha-sung is your dad, you can go to Dodgers games and Padres games for free. That'd be pretty cool. You meet all these major league players. But imagine if your dad was God. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> a little bit different. So that's what you should be mindful of when you're praying, our father. Think that he's my father. He's your father. We're all part of a family. The second part of the Lord's Prayer that you should be mindful of is fulfillment. The second thing that Jesus says is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when you pray this part, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, you should be asking yourself, what am I doing to advance God's kingdom? Am I making God's kingdom come? By loving your neighbor and loving those around you, you are advancing God's kingdom. But when you're unkind to your neighbors, that doesn't really advance God's kingdom. Are you making earth what it is like in heaven. The next thing Jesus says is, give us this day our daily bread. So the inconsistent, uh, in order to make it a nice bit of alliteration, I just put food. So Jesus is realistic. We need to pray for the things that we need. Now, you should notice that he says, give us this day our daily bread. He doesn't say, give us this day, tomorrow's, and Saturday's, and Sunday's, and Monday's, and Tuesday's, and next week's, and next month's, and next year's bread. Because bread, of course, could be a symbol or a metaphor for any number of things. A place to live, clothes to wear, a place to go to school, friends. Bread is kind of a symbol for your needs. But are you praying for all the needs you could ever possibly need? No, you're just praying for the things you need Today, In other words, 
don't worry about tomorrow. Now, this doesn't mean that you should act foolishly and think, well, I don't need to do my homework because there is no tomorrow because uh, Jesus said just think about today in terms of its needs. Absolutely not. But when it comes to your needs, Jesus is telling you to just think about what you need today. What do I need today? Today I have some classes. What am I going to need for today? Today I am going to have PE. May I have health today? May we not get hurt today? Don't worry about tomorrow. The next thing Jesus covers is forgiveness. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now this one's a tough one. This one's a tough one. I mean, it sounds straightforward, but in in practice, if you feel like you shouldn't be the one to have to say sorry, the other person, they're the ones that wronged you. He said, he called me a bad name first. He hurt me first. She took it from me first. She should be the one to say, I'm sorry first. I shouldn't have to say sorry first. That's not very forgiving. Being forgiving is being willing to say sorry no matter what. And you're sorry not being conditional. I'll say sorry if you promise not to say that again. Does Jesus forgive us conditionally? No, Jesus forgives us unconditionally. So your forgiveness should also be unconditional. And then lastly, faith. Jesus says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now this one is also a challenging one. The Lord may choose to test you. By testing, you can see how strong your faith is. It's the same reason teachers give you tests, to see if you know what you know. So God, in the same way, does put tests in front of people. In ninth grade English, we were talking about Job the other day. Job was someone who was tested. Jesus was tested. Now, God may give us these tests, but we shouldn't seek them out because tests may lead us into temptation. So we should pray that if we are tested, that God would give us the faith to endure through those temptations. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that the way we know the Lord's Prayer, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, that's known as what's called a doxology. A doxology is basically like a concluding statement. You guys know about conclusions in your papers. That's what a doxology is, but in a prayer. Now those words, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, it's a very good doxology. There's, it's completely theologically valid. In fact, it's very reminiscent of a verse in First Chronicles that David said. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. So that sounds a lot like, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So that is perhaps the scriptural basis for the doxology. But historically speaking, the doxology was incorporated into the Lord's Prayer by first century Christians in the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So, I would say it's time that we tried out the Lord's Prayer. Three, two, one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You're dismissed.